Now, to begin, I think we need to get some of our terms straight. That's kind of a, a big head full of stuff. You all know what I mean by the rabbit hole. The rabbit hole is what opens up in front of you at about 11.30 at night when you're peering at your computer and can't sleep and suddenly a portal opens into some other world and you dive down or you're sucked down or you fall in like Alice in Wonderland and suddenly you're someplace else. You're in a whole new world. You're in Crimea and you're investigating something you've never heard of before. That's the rabbit hole. The soul. Now we're not going to agree on this. What can we say about the soul that we can all agree upon? I think um, we don't want to get into theological conversation, but let's just say that the soul is a place of depth inside us. It's a reverberating cavern, a repository of thoughts and images. It's where we take core samples of our insides. It's, it's an echo chamber. Uh, the internet is changing. Um, Adam Ostrov, who Ostrov is the uh, senior vice president of content for the news website Mashable, and he said uh, a couple years ago, the internet is just a bunch of servers and broadband cables and routers that traffic data around the world. But I think now, the internet is starting to become an entity that society views as a human thing. I think that's good. I hope that's true, a human thing. Um, can you switch over the... There we go. Um, that seems to signal that the internet is changing. It's evolving. It's growing as we grow with it. What is it going to become? Is it a place of soul? What would that look like? What would that mean? What is a place of soul? Let's go back to our definition. It's a place with depth. Does the internet have depth? Or is it, as the media pundits tell us and the philosophers, it's really just shimmering surface images, apparent realities? Is it depth? or just apparent realities. And if it wanted to be a place of, of soul, how would we get it to be that? And would it be a good thing if it, would be, if it were? I'm a theater person. For me, it's a fairly simple equation. Um, I equate soul in a, with a room like this, a place on the earth where my body is and your bodies are, and we're all live, and we're all here together, and we're listening to one another, we're contemplating something together. That's a soulful place. But uh, let's look one step further. Um, are we sure that's all we want to be thinking about? I mean, I think the theater is a very traditional place. It thinks of itself as sort of the uh, protector of the analog. Uh, it, the theater is like the armed guard standing outside the vinyl record store. Um, we uh, like to think of ourselves as the antidote to all that digital stuff. But is that really what we want to be? Are we like the church during the Reformation? We're standing in the church all happy and cozy and warm, and outside Martin Luther's banging the the uh, pamphlet onto the door and sending out his message in a viral way with literacy and the printing press. I kind of think we want to do both. So I started thinking about this in 2004. I was, uh, went to Minneapolis to create a piece with my company, New Paradise Laboratories. This is our, our website. Um, and uh, we were brought there by the uh, Children's Theater Company of Minneapolis, which is a fantastic organization. They were making a series of, of pieces for young adults, and we were asked to create a piece based on the theme of prom, which is sort of the party we all have, we're all kind of go to at the end of our childhood or something. It's supposedly a kind of a rite of passage thing, but it's, it's mutated so far away from that, I'm not quite sure what it is. But the piece was wonderful, I think. It was, it was large, it was on a 60 foot long football field like stage installation that had a steel pyramid in the middle. 
There were 20 performers, eight professionals, and 12 teenagers. So when, as we made that piece, I got to hang out with teenagers a lot. Fast forward two years. The piece was successful both with audiences and critics, so we were called back again to do the same piece over again with a different teenage cast. So in 2006, we did it. In 2004, two years apart. And as I worked with that new cast, I began to kind of notice some things about them that surprised me. Uh, they would sit on couches together, and they'd put their heads together like this, and they would sort of whisper sweet nothings into each other's ears. And it was something that they did very easily, like pillow talk. And they didn't seem as anxious about being awkward. They were awkward. Who isn't? I think awkwardness is a function of soul in some kind of way. But they were awkward, but they didn't, well, they weren't awkward about being awkward. It didn't bother them that much. And, and so I was looking at that gang and looking at the 2004 gang, and as theater people do, we were ruminating about this and sort of proposing in a very non-scientific way, what could be the difference? And of course, in 2005, Facebook hit high school. That was when Facebook left the .edu domain, and suddenly high school kids could have a Facebook page. And of course, they, they all did. And you know, I think they were leaning against each other because they were exhausted. They never slept. <laughs> you know, they, they just hung out. All right, so I started thinking, like, is social media, apart from all of the you know, sort of reefer madness terror of it, is it, is, it, is it really going to change anything about us? I mean, it's going to change the political landscape. It's going to change the economic landscape. I mean, there's so many things that are going to change, but is it going to change our imaginations? And how might that happen? How might our imaginations change? So to illustrate this a little bit, imagine me in 1969 when I was 16 years old. What would I do at night when I was done with the day? I would go into my room. I would sit in a chair. I would read a book, I would listen to music, I might call somebody on the telephone, and that meant that I knew it was one person over there someplace, and I had to remember their phone number, which I can't remember my phone number anymore. I had to remember, and then I dialed, and it was, it was like a 45-second process <laughs> to just be able to get somebody on the phone. But what I was really doing was I was sort of inventing my insides. I would sit in the chair, and you might say it was rumination, you might say it was depression. But um, I would sort of go down deep, and I would, I would sort of ruminate and reverberate down deep inside of me in, in a vertical sort of way about my life, about things that were bothering me, and you know, too much rumination isn't a good thing. But in some ways, I was kind of inventing depth in myself. Okay. 2006, what does a teenager do at night when the day is done? They walk into their room, their parents are asleep, they put on a DVD or a CD, probably both at the same time. <laughs> they boot up their computer, but it's been on all day anyway. They can, now they're on their, their mobile phone. And they check in with a 24-hour-a-day roving, floating party with 400 of their best friends <laughs> all night long. So that's not so much as, as a, a journey of depth, it's a journey of breadth. It's a horizontal axis. It kind of takes them out into the world. And both those things are interesting. But I began to wonder, like, OK, maybe the solution here is in both depth and breadth. So we began to think of a theater piece. We began to imagine a theater piece that might exist in both realms. And this is what we started to invent. Fate book. This was 2007 or something. It sounds really corny to me right now. And this is like a six-year-old website. So, ooh, you know, <laughs> but, um, we wanted to make a piece that was in both real space and cyberspace, if you will, that had some of the aspects of the, the, the darkened room and some of the aspects of this global phenomenon. 
So what I did is I wrote a few emails. We got 400 people interested in auditioning. I asked them all to make videotapes, 30 seconds. This was the audition. They sent them in. Out of that, we eventually chose 13 individuals, th those are the ones. They're, they had to be good performers, and they also had to be good at the internet. So then we all met one cold day in January. We got into a room. We said, hi, this is who we are. Let's make up fake names. And so we all made up aliases. They said, this is going to be our character named blah, 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 blah. And then we left. And then each one of them made a Facebook page, and I was the director, sort of the the god of the Facebook, I guess. And I, I, I directed them all, I sent them all on missions to find themselves, to create their bios, to create their characters to, as, as some kind of hefty thing. And I, and I directed them to go over here and hang out with that person online, and then go over here and hang out with that person online. And sometimes they actually made dates, and they went out and they met each other using their, fa their fictional personae. And over time, a story developed and a kind of a scenario and something that we found uh, you know, was worthy of being a story that was worthy of being told. And eventually that became the show. Now what they did then was they went out and they friended as their real selves, they friended all their friends into their fictional selves. So pretty soon we had 5,000 people like wandering around in this weird little domain of fiction. All of this is completely against the Facebook terms of service. I'm looking at the video camera. Um, so, uh, and, and so they, you could hang out with all of those characters in Facebook, or you could come to the website, and this is what you got here. Let me see. Hmm. Uh, I'm going to click on Clayton. So if you went to Clayton's page, this is what you'd see. You'd see a little bio stuff up here. You could friend Clayton on Facebook. You could follow K Clayton on Twitter. And you could see a little video that Clayton made to express something about himself that he thought was important. You see there's a certain amount of risk involved in this little video, and um, uh, that was what the piece became about, the risk of turning into a professional person. Let me, let me uh, move to someplace else real quick here. Just to give you another sense, this is Ame, and this was the video she made of herself. She happened to be a mountain climber. This worked really well with the, the risk-taking idea of the show, Fate Look. And so the piece became about a party that started online in, in people's Facebook world and in their PJs and then eventually led to a party where the audience and the actors came together. See? Like, and my question, I guess, is, is this, an, is this a... A, 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 a kind of little soul meme. I don't know. All right, so, and there's other things on the website. I, I don't have time to really take you through it. I mean, you could go to a thing like this, and, and we shot these. So it's very arty. There are these, there are these uh, crying videos where they're looking into a webcam crying. This is still up online, by the way. I'm, I'm cruising this live. And, and like there's a kissing booth. <laughs> so you get the idea. Now, um, uh, move forward, let's move forward to the performance, and I just have a couple minutes left. So, um, this is the performance you went in together into a loading dock that went into a warehouse that had 10 video screens, screens 10 separate video environments. This is the video loading dock door going up. You see it looks like all these...
you know, uh, Hi. So here laptops. We are. What is the fate book? Where you go to investigate something, peek in, lurk. Your job? Watch. Be safe. Oh. I'm somewhere in here, too. I hope you'll find me. Over. So you then led up into a, an environment where you followed, you tracked characters all through. It's called promenade style theater. And over time, you got to know the story and you got to know the people in a real space sort of way. You see, and the, the, each environment was created with video, etc. All right. So, was this an experience of soul? I don't know, you tell me. I think so. I think it, 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 it brought depth. It, 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 it crossed over between the two realms. It felt satisfying. I, I have to say we have another piece called uh, Extremely Public Displays of Privacy. That was an even deeper incursion into the rabbit hole uh, with lots of strange twists and turns. Seven intersecting websites, smartphone delivered tour in downtown Philadelphia, and then a live concert. Uh, through this kind of work, we've reached uh, over several hundred thousand people around the world, a little tiny experimental theater company. So I think, you know, from that standpoint, things are, are very interesting. I, I want to leave you um, with a couple of thoughts. I was listening to a table of, of the wonderful students that are helping out back there, this TED, uh, TEDx conference, and uh, someone named Amber, who was, they were all talking about the latest thing they had seen on the internet. And you have to realize that they get the majority of their entertainment from their com computers. So what does that mean for the theater? Um, Amber was saying, we, they were talking about Tumblr, which is the third largest social media site in the United States under Facebook and Twitter. She were talking about Tumblr. It's so much deeper. And so, you know, is that evolution? of some sort. I'm going to leave you with a little poem uh, from Rumi. He's the, the sort of master of the soul realm from the Sufi standpoint. And this is the poem. The breeze at dawn has secrets to tell you. Don't go back to sleep. You must ask for what you really want. Don't go back to sleep. People are going back and forth across the, the door sill where the two worlds touch. The door is round and open. Don't go back to sleep. Thank you.